Welcome to the Dinosaur George podcast, a show about paleontology and other earth sciences. Dinosaur George is a public speaker, author, and TV host with 30 years of study in paleontology. He has performed live in over 4,500 events across the US and Canada. Now, here is Dinosaur George. Well, hey there, everybody. Welcome to a special edition podcast. This is podcast number 103. What makes it special? Well, I've decided to dedicate the entire podcast to answering the questions submitted by you, the listeners. The Ask Dinosaur George segment is all you're going to hear in this particular podcast. There is no feature creature. There are no interviews, just me answering your questions. So I hope you guys enjoy it. We've just received so many questions that I decided it would be easier just to answer them all at one time instead of doing a few every podcast so sit back and enjoy yourself i hope you like this it's time to ask dinosaur george in this segment george answers your questions about paleontology if you would like to leave a voice message call us at 210-888-9077 this is not a toll-free call so children please ask your parents permission If you would like to submit your question in writing, go to DinosaurGeorge.com and click the Ask Dinosaur George page. Questions are chosen at random and we clear all messages monthly. So if you have a question about paleontology, ask Dinosaur George. Hey there, George. My name's Paul. I'm calling from Miami, Florida. I just wanted to say I'm a huge fan. I'm so happy you're coming out of the podcast that I can now stream from my phone. It's awesome to hear you say all this stuff. And um, my quick question was just as a person who has uh, dropped out of college and is very interested in paleontology, what are your best, best tips to be able to get into the field without college? Because I know I've spoken to you before and you said you didn't actually do it through college. So I would love to become an established paleontologist. Just I don't see college as a foreseeable option. If you have any tips, I'd love to hear them. Thanks for being so awesome. Love having you as a Facebook friend, liking your posts. And I just wish you the best luck with everything. Have a wonderful day. Well, hey there, Paul. Nice to hear from you. I hope everything is going great in Miami. Um, Thank you so much for for taking the time to mention you appreciate the podcast. I'm glad to be able to do it because, again, there are a lot of people that like to listen on the road or on the way home from school or on the way back from work or on the way to work, whatever the case is. So thank thank you so much. I'm I'm glad you enjoy it. Um, You know, I was fortunate in that I was able to sort of carve out my own career in paleontology without the benefit of having a degree in paleontology. And that's a hard way to go. I, I can assure you that, you know, having any sort of a degree is going to help you, but it doesn't limit you to not being able to do it. So my recommendation would be kind of two things. You can kind of take the direction I took, which is. I invested some money into a variety of different replicas. I honed my speaking skills and I started approaching schools. I focus on elementary schools, but I started approaching schools saying, listen, I'd like to share information about paleontology because it's a subject that a lot of kids like, but there's not a lot of information out there uh, to the schools, basically. And so I started charging a fee to come in and I would do a 30 to 45 minute presentation and over time, my uh, uh, that that career took off. I started speaking nonstop. It was five days a week, sometimes two schools a day, sometimes four shows a day, and that evolved into um, a full time career where that's all I do now is travel pretty much nonstop. But it's a great starting point. It's a great way to kind of get your feet wet and get yourself into it. Now, there's other ways. Uh, for instance, you may want to look at uh, working at a museum. Most museums are going to look for volunteers, but again, it's a good way to get your get your start. And once you've got a sort of an established uh, pattern of working and you may find that they may want to bring you on as a paid employee if you can, you know, if you do enough. Um, So, again, I would say to sit down, sort of look at which direction you want to go. Do you want to work for a private entity where you're prepping fossils? Because they're always looking for help. Do you want to work for a museum? Maybe prepping. That may be the way to get into it. Or you may want to work for a museum in an outreach capacity or do what I do, go to schools. But whatever the case, uh, I wish you the very best of luck. And again, I'm glad 
I, I'm glad that you like the podcast, and I'm really glad that we're friends on Facebook as well. So thanks so much for the question. Hi, George. This is Tom from California, and my question is, I was always wondered what is your favorite dinosaur from Russia? Thank you, Dinosaur George. Bye. Well, hey there, Tom. Thank you so much for your question and for calling. Uh, you know, Russia is one of those places where I don't, I don't spend enough time talking about some of the discoveries out of there. Now, as for my favorite dinosaur, you know, Russian dinosaurs are pretty limited. And uh, Kyleskus is the only, only dinosaur that I'm really familiar with um, that I think lived there. I'm almost sure it did. It is a small theropod that has this cool looking blade on its nose. Uh, I'm very... I'm very interested in any of the ceratosaurs or any of the dinosaurs that have the horns or the strange protrusions from the skull. So that's why I'm attracted to him. And I find him to be pretty amazing. Um, like I said, he's small. He's not gigantic by any stretch, but he doesn't need to be gigantic. I think he was from the Jurassic period, if, if memory serves me correctly. But I just know that I really like him a lot. But I got to tell you, my all-time favorite Russian prehistoric animals are some of the Gorgonopsians and some of the Permian critters. Man, do I love some of the things that have been discovered in Russia when it comes to Permian. Holy smokes, are those animals incredible. Creepy looking. What a vicious world it must have been. So although I, I of course, love dinosaurs, I've got to say that in Russia, my focus has always been some of the Permian animals. But thank you so much. I, I, I wonder if you are from Russia or if you've ever been to Russia before. Uh, I've never been. So if you are from Russia or you've lived there once before, maybe you can be my tour guide and we'll go investigate some of the museums to find out what kind of critters we're calling Russia home. Hello, um, I'm Trey Watson. Uh, I'm from Waco, Texas in the United States. And uh, my question is, is that uh, it's about the Permian period. Um, did Dementrodons or that group of species ever um, live or interact with uh, archosaurs? Because I was just thinking about it because archosaurs lived in the late Permian, but um, Dementrodon lived in the entire Permian period, I believe. Um, I was just wondering. Uh, so, yeah, that's my question. Hopefully I made it in. Um, and the Permian life theme. So, yeah. Goodbye. I hope you have a good day. Hey there, Trey. It's great to hear from you. I suspect you are Trey, my assistant Trey, from your voice. I hope I'm right. If I'm not, you sound just like a young man named Trey who happens to live in Waco, Texas, who happens to show up at some of my events and assist me. So, um, your question is pretty, pretty interesting, especially because I just came off of talking about how much I love the Permian uh, animals from Russia, and then your question pertains to the Permian, so I find that kind of cool. Um, you know, Dimitrodon, I believe, died out before the archosaurs really kind of started taking over. So I don't know if those animals would have ever met, if, if any of the archosaurs would have come in contact. Now, certainly some of their predecessors were that, that, that were there because the archosaurs kind of gave rise from earlier animals that would have lived with Dimetrodon, but whether or not Dimetrodon actually interacted with the true family of archosaurs, that is a question I don't know. So you've really stumped me. I wish I knew the answer. Hopefully somebody listening will post a comment. Uh, you know, you can go to my, my podcast page. It's dinosaurgeorgepodcast.com. And uh, leave your comments if, if you think that, uh, you know, if I say something that's inaccurate or something you disagree with, please feel free to leave your comments. I always look forward. I only ask that you leave respectful comments. I don't tolerate rudeness. If somebody says something and you disagree with it, the scientific way to do it is disagree by explaining your points. But to attack the person individually, that's not acceptable in science. That's not science at all. That's foolishness. And I do not put up with foolishness. So anyway, Trey, if this is you, uh, I want you to know that, that uh, I was in touch with your mom. And I want you to know how saddened I was at the family loss that you had, the, the person in your family who is uh, who we've lost. Uh, I only met him once and he was an incredibly kind man. So uh, I just want you to know, Trey, how much I, it saddened me that that happened. All right, uh, let's keep going. This time, 
let's go to the computer and let's go to the Ask Dinosaur George questions that I've had written to me. Would you like to buy fossil replica skulls, teeth, claws, and more? Then visit our catalog at store.dinosaurgeorge.com. We sell replicas rather than real fossils so that we don't deplete the resources. Our replicas and casts are museum quality and look real, but are much more affordable. From dinosaurs to ice-aged mammals to modern animal skulls, there is something for everyone. Visit our online catalog at store.dinosaurgeorge.com and start your collection of amazing Amazing fossil replicas today. All right, I'm going to go right into my computer and I'm just going to go right down the list and just randomly click on these and see if we can answer them. This first one is from my friend Noah from Shippensburg, uh, Pennsylvania. Noah has been a longtime friend. Hey, George, I'm writing a comic that has dinosaurs. I'm going to have some famous species, but I also want to use some little known ones. Which little known dinosaurs would you like? Cheers. Wow, Noah, that's a tough one because there's so many amazing dinosaurs that don't get any sort of publicity, sometimes because there's just not much known about them. But other times, you know, the media is interested in the biggest, the grandest, the coolest. And I think they sometimes miss the opportunity to highlight some of the others. You know who I'd love to see get some attention would be some of the other dromaeosaurs. Um, you know, everybody knows about uh, Deinonychus and Velociraptor and Utah Raptor to a point and then Dakota Raptor now. But but there's so many other ones that don't get any attention. I would love to see some of them. But it's hard to say because, of course, you know, you've got to choose who makes sense to fit in with your family, uh, with your story, not with your family. <laughs> but so... Uh, I would write your outline of your story first and then figure out who makes sense. So, Noah, great to hear from you. All right, Jeffrey from Acton, Massachusetts. Hey, DG. Hey there, Jeffrey. How did Pachycephalosaurus's nest? Wow. Boy, I wish I would have read that question when I did the previous episode where we highlighted Pachycephalosaurus. Pachycephalosaurus were our um, featured creature, and I wish I would have thought to even ask uh, Mike Trebold, because he may have known, you know, I don't know if there's ever been any eggs found from Pachycephalosaurus. Therefore, I don't think they've ever found nests. I don't think anybody would have any idea how. Now, perhaps they were like, you know, modern birds, ground nesting, of course, you know, like an ostrich or a swan or a goose, animals that nest on the ground, you know, perhaps the male or the female or both may have stayed there to protect the babies. But unfortunately, this is a question that I just don't, I just don't know the answer to, Jeffrey. I'd be interested if anybody else could could make a suggestion. I don't know. All right, let's see. Let's do Daniel from Israel. Hi, DG, I have a question to you. How or who was the predator of Shantungasaurus? And if it's adult size, did they have any predators to hunt them down? Well, Daniel, first of all, greetings to you and all of your family and friends in Israel. Thank you for writing. You know, Shantungasaurus is a big hadrosaur. For those of you that may not be familiar with him, he's a duckbill, a hadrosaur, enormous, really big. I suspect that there is not much that would have attacked a full-grown Shantungasaurus. During its time, it lived with, I know there was there was a Tyrannosaur, I don't know if it was Batar, if I don't know if he was with him or not, but I do believe there was a Tyrannosaur living at the same time in the same place. So I suspect that the young would have been targeted. Sort of think about modern African elephants. Lions are not going to mess with an adult elephant. They're out of their mind to do it. They'd be stomped to death. So I believe the same thing would have occurred with Shantungasaurus. I think most predators would have left the adults alone and targeted the babies. All right, let's click on this one. Uh, Michael from Lago Vista, Texas. Uh, Dear Mr. Blasting, first of all, I'm a huge fan of your work, and I love that you're spreading paleontology to people who might otherwise uh, get to see it beyond the normal public view. Well, thank you very much, uh, Michael. That's very kind of you, and I appreciate you referring to me as Mr. Blasting, but you know what? You can call me George. You can call me Dinosaur George. You can call me DG. I do not take offense to anyone referring to me in those terms, although I really appreciate your respect and, uh, and courtesy. So here's this question. My question for you is this. Many people have theorized about 
late Tyrannosaurus possessing some amount of feathers. But I've been wondering about a species a bit closer to home, namely Acrocanthosaurus. It is much farther removed from dinosaurs that were usually connected with heavy feather covering. So how likely is it that Acro may have had some sort of feather covering? Thank you for much for taking the time to answer this, and I wish you and, and yours all the best. Well, thank you very much, Michael, for taking the time to write to me, and thank you again for your courtesy. Speaks volumes of you and certainly your parents who raised you. Uh, what a great question. Dating back to the mid-Cretaceous or maybe late Jurassic, were there feathered predators back then? You know, all the attention we see is being placed on some of the some of the uh, later Cretaceous, late Cretaceous animals being feathered. Now, of course, when you look at dinosaurs like Archaeopteryx, well, there you have a Jurassic Age animal that clearly is feathered. So feathers precede Archaeopteryx. Feathered dinosaurs, I suspect, precede Archaeopteryx. So by saying that, then is it likely that all theropods from, let's say, the mid-Jurassic on may have had feather coverings? I don't know. On one hand, I feel like we jump to conclusions with this feather thing where suddenly everybody wants to feather every single predator that ever lived. And on the other hand, we can't ignore the fact that more feathered dinosaurs are being found. So I think we have to kind of find a balance. And my opinion would be that if there were feathers on Acrocanthosaurus, I think they would be less flamboyant. They wouldn't be as big as, say, Feathers on a on a dromaeosaur who may have had much bigger feathers to be used as a display. I think that might have been a uh, something that evolved later on that if there were feathers, it was probably the young acros that had feathers. And if they had them, it was probably for temperature regulation, because I believe the function of feathers would have been to help regulate temperature and then the side effect of feathers was ultimately to be used for display hope that makes sense all right this is from dakota raptor tim from morgan hill california dakota raptor tim what a great name george my name is tim really big fan of your jurassic fight club series hope you're doing well thank you uh, tim that's very kind of you i was just wondering about this new dinosaur discovery in china um his name is yi chi some people pronounce it we qui it's spelled y i q i okay here's my question about it do you think yi chi could have used powered flight or did it only glide hope you're doing well and have a nice day thank you tim thank you dakota raptor tim for your courtesy and i hope you and your family and friends are all doing well as well so this dinosaur yi chi or yi qui however you pronounce it is an amazingly odd looking critter for anybody that doesn't are not familiar with it um please uh google it and go try to find it and look at it it appears to be this bat winged uh little theropod it must have been a terrifying sight so the question is could it sustain flight by flapping its arms you know i i do not know i've never done enough study to know does it have the musculature and the the bone configuration skeletal configuration to be able to fly flapping its wings i don't know you know think about gliding squirrels there's an animal that jumps and spreads his arms and a membrane kind of acts as a parachute and he's able to glide from spot to spot so the question is well is that what this little dinosaur did or did it have the skeletal structure that allowed it to actually flap those wings i wish i knew the answer to this tim but I'm going to have to admit that I do not. But I'll see if maybe I can find an expert who will come on and tell us a little more information about this dinosaur. Maybe I'll make this a, a uh, uh, featured creature on an upcoming podcast. All right, let's jump down to try this one real quick. This is Jonathan from Morgantown, Kentucky. Hey, DG, I hope this message finds you in good spirits. Well, thank you very much. That's very kind of you. It does. He says, I keep hearing about Brontosaurus coming back into favor as it's been suggested that the idea that Brontosaurus and Apatosaurus were the same dinosaur has now been called into question. What are your opinions on this matter and what exactly has caused this to come into question? Thank you very much for your time. I hope you continue to do what you do 
as I believe you are doing a great thing and answering so many questions and helping people learn that they aren't when they aren't able to find just by searching online. Well, Jonathan, thank you. That is incredibly kind of you. Uh, and I appreciate it. And I hope everybody enjoys it. I know I enjoy uh, I enjoy doing it. So Brontosaurus, you know, Brontosaurus is that dinosaur that was named Brontosaurus. And then somebody said, no, no, no. The bones of that dinosaur are identical to this dinosaur that was named earlier. And its name is Apatosaurus. And because Apatosaurus got the name first, then Brontosaurus is not a legitimate name. Well, now, after all of these years, people have come back and said, wait a minute, they are not identical. There is enough difference and differences between them to justify one being named Brontosaurus, one being named Apatosaurus. Now, what are those differences? I don't know. I do not know. Uh, is it that the differences are very slight? And that's why some people are saying, nope, they had it right the first time. Or are the differences significant enough to clearly say these are two different animals? I suspect new discoveries have occurred that have rekindled this debate. That's what I suspect, Jonathan. I would. I don't think they're looking at the exact same evidence that was looked at when they first found this, this error in naming. Clearly, I think they're finding more. And so it may be likely that they have found enough material from both of these animals to clearly suggest that they are two different species. Unfortunately, I'm unaware of what that material is and what that information is. I just know that what I love about science is that we are constantly finding and correcting and rehypothesizing things that we thought were the fact. That's the greatest role so many of you young people are going to play. Those of you that decide to make paleontology your career, there is no telling what you might bring that would help us realize that all along we've been incorrect about something. A new technology will help us do that. All right, uh, let's just jump in another one here. This is Carmine from Bradenton, Florida. You know, Carmine, I love Bradenton, Florida. I went there once ate at the nicest restaurant sitting right on the ocean. It was beautiful. Your beaches are magnificent. I've only been there once, but I enjoyed it. Carmine says, hello, Mr. Blasting. I hope you're doing well. I am my friend Carmine again, George DG, Dinosaur George, whatever. But I do appreciate your respectfulness. I would like to know how many valid species of Allosaurus are there? Whoa. Ooh, this is a, this is a, this is a tough one. The last time I checked, I believe there was eight but how many valid species and also he asked is allosaurus jim mats and i one of them well i think allosaurus jim mats and i is still being described so i don't know if that name is legal let me tell you about jim mats and i uh i was very very fortunate to meet jim madsen the dinosaur that this was named after uh he was the kindest he was not with us any longer but he was the kindest most decent man i'd ever met he was an idol to me and I loved Allosaurus and I was very fortunate. I got to fly up and spend some time with him and he was such a kind guy. He was so nice. So I hope that if Allosaurus Jim Madsen, I is not a valid species. I hope it becomes one just because of him and his legacy for what he, what, what he contributed to paleontology. So how many species are there valid species? Again, I think I don't know. I thought there was eight the last time I checked and I don't know all of them. Uh, Fragilis obviously is the one I love the most and that's the one I focus on, but I don't know if what the other ones are. I do know that there's a lot of bait, a debate about a lot of those uh, species, whether they are valid or not, or whether they are just juvenile or adults of a, an already uh, named species. All right, Carmine, thank you again for taking the time to write to me. I really appreciate that. All right, let's do uh uh, Johnny from Rejarva, Finland. Uh, I think I pronounced that Rejarvia, Rejarvi, Finland. I don't know how to pronounce it, but uh, Johnny, his name is spelled J-O-N-I, but thank you for putting in parentheses how to pronounce your name. I really appreciate you doing that because it's very difficult for me. Here in the States, I would have I would have read that as Joni. So thank you, Johnny, for, for letting me know. He says, hello, jo George, this is your number one fan from Finland. Johnny, you are truly my number one Finlandish fan. And one day I'm coming to your country to meet you and look around. Okay, says I got two questions. I once drew conodonts feeding on placoderm like lampreys or leeches. But my friends in the Internet said that they more likely ate something else. 
what do most paleontologists think about what they ate? Okay, conodonts, for those of you, they look like lampreys. I am of the opinion, based on how small their mouth is, that they probably did feed like lampreys and they probably did act like leeches in that they would attach themselves to the prey and just take small bites. It's not like these animals are going to overpower something. I don't believe they're going to attack something alive or something big and hope to be able to subdue it. They don't have, they're, they're shaped like an eel almost, but it's that round mouth that limits what they can do. So instead, I believe they are spending their time finding prey that is already dead and they are scavenging off of it. So that's what I think. I think you're right. Now, I don't know what most paleontologists think about it because I don't think I've ever read anything. And I certainly am not an expert when it comes to that animal. So I may be way off base, but I am solely basing my opinion on what I've seen of the animal and the appearance of its mouth and what I think are its jaws configuration. And therefore, I think they have limitations and I believe that uh, I believe that they are uh, probably eating like lampreys or leeches, attaching themselves and just sort of uh, taking advantage of whatever they can find. All right. Uh, the second question is, I read once that intelodonts were distant relatives of hippos. And that made me wonder, could intelodonts just be vegetarians with deadly teeth like their modern relatives of hippos? Ah, oh, what a fine question, Johnny. Very, very good. His question basically is, just because intelodonts have those big canine-like teeth, does that mean that they're actually carnivores? Because when you look at a hippo, they have big, huge canines, and those are used more for combat and not for killing prey. Here's the difference between the two of them, uh, Johnny. Intelodonts have, in the rear of their mouth, meat-slicing teeth that are solely designed for slicing meat. So when you combine meat slicing teeth with big carnassial, big carnivore, big pointy shaped teeth in the front, the combination of those two then suggests that this animal is indeed a carnivore. And then also there's been evidence to, that demonstrates that there are bite marks in herbivores that are attributed to intelodonts. So that adds more credibility. Finally, one other thing I want to mention about hippos. I saw a video that I'll never forget, a video of a hippo that came out of the water and there was a dead water buffalo and this hippo came out of the water and walked up and just took a gigantic bite and chomped and ate and went back into the water. So is it possible that these animals are omnivores? I don't know. I don't know. It was pretty impressive though. Why he did it, I don't know. Maybe he just decided to try it, but whatever the case, it happened once, so maybe it's happened before. All right. I tell you guys what, let me take a little break and give my voice a rest because I'm doing these nonstop. Let me take a break, play a commercial so I can earn the multi-million dollars it takes for me to own my private jets and Ferraris. I don't have any of that. I'm joking with you guys. Calm down. Bring Dinosaur Georgia's traveling exhibit to your school, museum, or city. This is the largest exhibit of its kind in North America and will turn any facility into a natural history museum. You'll see things like prehistoric mammals, giant fish, ancient reptiles, and of course, dinosaurs. It's affordable, amazing, and will be an event you'll never forget. See complete details at dinosaurgeorge.com or call us toll free, 888-487-7478. Bring Dinosaur George's Traveling Museum to your community today. All right, everybody, I'm back. You are listening to a special edition podcast, podcast number 103. This podcast is dedicated solely to answering the questions we receive from all of you through our Ask Dinosaur George page or our number. What you can do if you'd like to uh, submit your question, you can call us at area code 210-888-9077. Leave your message and we'll uh, hopefully answer your question. Or you can go to the website, dinosaurgeorge.com. Click on the Ask Dinosaur George page and fill out the form and submit it that way. And finally, you can contact us. You can leave a message worldwide by going through Skype. Uh, search for me. My Skype handle is dinosaur.george. So if you go there, you can submit your questions. And again, we pick them randomly. Keep your questions short and to the point and chances are much better that we will answer them. All right, let's get back into it. Let's go with Frank from Stratford, Connecticut. Hello, Mr. Blassing. I hope you're doing well, and I'm glad that you're back. Thank you, Frank. I'm glad to be back again for all of you. 
cannot tell you how much I appreciate your courtesy and your respect, but you are welcome, Frank, to call me George, DG, Dino George, whatever, whatever you like. So here's Frank's question. What do you think was the cause for the extinction event at the end of the Jurassic period? Thank you for answering my questions, and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thank you, Frank. I hope your day and week and month and year have been great, and I hope all of your family and friends are having a great year as well. The extinction at the end of the Jurassic is, is a little difficult because there's not a lot of places on Earth where that time period is exposed, where it's easily recognizable. You know, when we look at the Cretaceous extinction, we have much more evidence because first, there's a lot more Cretaceous formations available to us, but also it's much more recent. You know, when you think about the span of time, the Jurassic period was so long ago that so much of the evidence may have been completely eliminated from the from the record because of erosion. You know, if an asteroid had hit, uh, let's say it hit right in the middle of North America at the end of the Jurassic, and let's just say for the sake of argument that caused the extinction event, well, the evidence of that impact crater might be gone by now, leaving nothing behind because over the years, Tectonic movements have raised and lowered land and wind and rain and all of those things can ultimately grind down all of the evidence. So the difficulty with knowing for certain what caused it is we're going so far back in time. Just to give you guys an idea so that you understand what I mean about the amount of time, the time that separates you and I from Tyrannosaurus Rex is almost equal to the time that separates Tyrannosaurus Rex from Allosaurus, which is a late Jurassic dinosaur. That's how far back in time we're going. I've seen proposals that it was caused by a lot of volcanic activity, that a raise in uh, CO2 levels caused a change in global environments, and that may have caused the extinction. I, I just don't know. I don't know if anybody has ever definitive, well, not definitively and you can't definitively say something in paleontology, but you can say with a lot of study and research what you believed happened. I don't know what that is. Um, you know, is it possible that it was associated with a uh, with an asteroid, which seems to cause a lot of headaches for planets? Uh, yeah, it's certainly it's certainly possible if that asteroid struck in the ocean in the deepest part of the ocean and left no clue or if the asteroid struck and is now covered by ice or if the asteroid struck and has been eliminated from the record because of erosion who is to say i just i just don't know enough frank i wish i had a better answer than that but thank you very much for writing to me i appreciate it all right let's just jump to this this is hashim from pakistan a province in punjab a place called is it lahore l-a-h-o-r-e Whatever it is, Hashim, welcome. Uh, greetings from my country to yours. I wish I would have a chance to visit Pakistan because I have a lot of friends that tell me it is a beautiful place. So here we go. He says, hello, DG. How was Ceratosaurus able to survive in a world filled with larger and more dangerous carnivores and herbivores? And what was its role in the Jurassic era? My guess, he says was that it lived a life similar to a leopard, living in dense forests and underbrush where it could move more easily with its slender long body compared to the more compact and less grateful, graceful body of an Allosaurus, which inhabited a more grassland-based bio, uh, biomass. Could it be possible that the Ceratosaurus was nocturnal, hiding for more deadly and bigger animals during the day, but snuck out at night, maybe having... Um, a uh, having maybe leopard like spots, which helped it hide from its environment in the darkness. Uh, that is my guess. So what do you think? P.S. Sorry for the long message. Have a great day. Now, Hashim, your message was not considered long. I don't want you guys to feel like you have to submit a one word question. What I mean by keeping the, the messages short is sometimes people will ask five, six, seven, eight, nine questions in one one uh, message. And when we open up the the form, we see this novel and we're like, we, I don't even have time to even answer one of these. So that's what I mean. Yours were perfectly fine and to the point. And I like the fact that you just didn't ask me my opinion, but that you included your ideas. That is very important when it comes to science. It can't be because I have a microphone 
and a platform to spout out my opinions. That doesn't mean my opinions are more valid than yours. Doesn't mean they're right. Um, but uh, I like the fact that you gave us yours. So how would Ceratosaurus survive in an environment where there was larger predators and certainly larger herbivores? Well, every animal has its niche. Look at today. You have foxes living alongside deer, living alongside cows, living alongside coyotes, which are bigger, and mountain lions and dogs. And yet they are able to figure out a way to survive by adapting to all of those uh, those things. Ceratosaurus is not a little dinosaur. I know a lot of times what we see in museums is small uh, examples. Ceratosaurus is a fairly good sized dinosaur that probably could hold his own if he needed to. But I agree with you that he's not competing head on with some of these big boys. I think he's probably keeping his distance. Well, I, I had an opportunity one time to, to uh, talk to Dr. Robert Bacher and Dr. Bacher hypothesized that Ceratosaurus may be aquatic, that his flexible tail allowed him to swim almost crocodilian like he doesn't have those reinforced struts, those those uh, connective uh, rods that keep a theropod's tail stiff and his is not like that. So maybe it's possible that he was aquatic. He's eating fish. So during the day, big old Allosaurus is out there stomping around looking for somebody to eat and standing in the river next to him is Ceratosaurus, who Allosaurus is not going to waste his time messing with because they're hunting two different things. That may be a possibility. It is possible that they could have been nocturnal, but the only thing I think that's missing from that is the size of the orbits. The eyes are not exceptionally large, and I would suspect that for an animal to be nocturnal, it would have evolved much bigger eye sockets uh, to hold bigger eyes to be able to collect more light so that's why you look at an owl and they usually they look like their eyes are too big for their head that's what i suspect would happen if ceratosaurus was nocturnal whatever the case ceratosaurus is an amazing dinosaur absolutely one of my faves and i'm glad that you wrote hashim and again uh from the u.s to pakistan's greetings to you and all of your family and friends let's try another one uh kent from tulsa oklahoma Hey, George, big fan. Thank you, buddy. Uh, love the podcast idea. Thank you, Kent. I appreciate that. And I hope uh, I hope you you listen to this one with your question. My question is, do you think that there is any way that something like Megalodon could have survived in modern era and may just dwell too far down to be readily seen? I know it's very unlikely, but wanted to get your take. Well, thank you, Kent. Um, in science, we have to learn not to be so definitive about possibilities. Um, I'm the first to say that I find it very unlikely that Megalodon still exist. I do not think they do because in my opinion, had they survived and still existed, we would suspect to find modern whales with very large injuries who had been attacked, but got away. It's just going to be, it's natural thing to happen. Predators don't make a kill. It's like, you see seals all the time with these real dramatic wounds that can be attributed to a great white shark. The great white didn't kill the seal, but it certainly wounded him. I suspect we would see that with whales as well. Now, I had somebody send me pictures of a whale with injuries where they said, see, this is evidence. Well, those injuries could have been associated with the propellers of a large ship, you know, like a big naval ship or something that could have done that. There's other things that can happen. So an injury doesn't immediately prove or disprove the existence of megalodon but i'm saying we should see a variety of injuries that you can see a big circular bite taken out of something uh and we just don't see that the other thing is that yes the ocean is a big place but we're constantly mapping it and there's constantly deep sea vessels and there's submarines that are constantly moving around the planet and you would suspect that something as big as a megalodon would show up but on the other hand We've discovered new shark species we never knew existed that are in deeper water that nobody knew were there. And those discoveries were sort of by accident or by luck. So is it possible? Yes. Is it likely? I do not think so. Thank you, Kent. Appreciate it. Hope all is well in Oklahoma. Hey, speaking of Oklahoma, Kent, 
you know, with my traveling dinosaur museum, Oklahoma is a target that we're going to begin to promote and advertise with the hopes of being able to come up there. So we may one day be in the Tulsa area with our traveling museum. And when we do, I hope you show up so I can meet you in person. All right. Our next question is from Adrian from Houston, Texas. Adrian says, what do you think T-Rex's arms are used for? And also, I really miss your your videos on YouTube. Well, Adrian, thank you very much. I, I am so sorry that I can't do more YouTube videos. But the problem is that it takes me so much time to set up a green screen and backdrops and lighting and sound equipment and all of the things necessary and then to film and then to convert that um, and, and edit it and do all the stuff necessary. I just don't have the time to do that. One of the benefits of now doing it through podcasts is that I don't have any of that stuff to deal with. I can record what I want. I can edit what's necessary. I can post it and I'm done. Uh, I can sit here in sweatpants and an old torn up t-shirt and do these podcasts. I don't even, I don't even have to shave. <laughs> How nice is that? So I suspect that podcasts are going to be the direction I'll be going unless something changes. But I hope that you listen to these podcasts. And, you know, I, I know that I've I've converted some of them and posted them on YouTube and there was some sound quality issues. But I will address that, hopefully fix that. And hopefully these will sound better. All right. To your questions about what did they use their arms for? Boy, that's a great question. What did Tyrannosaurus Rex use those little arms for? Because we can tell that there are attachments where the muscles go and we can sort of estimate the size of the muscles. They're used for something because nature would not give them that much, much musculature if it didn't intend for it to be used. So whether those little arms might have been useful in grappling with, with its prey, I don't know if that's the truth or not, because the skull and mouth are so far forward that you'd think all it has to do is grab you with its mouth and those little arms aren't going to do much. Um, were they used in the reproduction uh, of the animals when, when the animals were reproducing? That's a possibility. I saw a proposal where they said if it fell down, it could use those little arms to give it a shove to stand it back up. I, I, I don't I don't think that's that's a, a realistic use because really does it matter if you're laying flat on your stomach or if you're up a foot and a half? Does that distance mean the difference between being able to stand or not? I, I don't I don't know if I necessarily buy that. So unfortunately, all I'm left with, Adrian, is telling you I don't know and I can't imagine what the function is, although I, I really, I really wish that uh, I really wish that I knew. All right, let's finish with one more. Uh, this is from Daniel from San Antonio says, Dear Dinosaur George, I was a volunteer at one of your tours at the KLRN building on the 16th of August. Ah, Daniel, I remember you and I appreciate very much that uh, I appreciate very much that you came in and gave your time. Daniel said, I just felt bad about, uh, I, I felt bad about something. I want to let you know that I was unable to make it that second day because I didn't have a ride. Um, so he said, I, 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 it's not my character to bail out and I enjoyed working with the children. Well, I really appreciate Daniel that you take the time to tell me, I understand that you couldn't get a ride. You're volunteering your time. And so, you know, I appreciate it. And if you were un un unable to make that second day, it doesn't mean that the work you did is any less valuable. And we absolutely appreciated your help. So here is a question. We have often depicted dinosaurs in recent years as upright creatures, but with lizard like body structure, as in their bodies are depicted close to their skeleton, meaning they don't have much mass between the bones and the skin. Sometimes when a dinosaur died, it left an imprint of feathers or skin patterns. Is there any way to tell if dinosaurs had any fat? That would drastically change the way we see them. And I'm thinking they may have had more, uh, more mass than generally depicted. Um, did dinosaurs have fat? That's his question. Well, Daniel, what, um, what an interesting question. Did they have layers of fat that would have made them look fatter than what we often see them depicted as? And oftentimes we see them as being slim line and like to, to his point, more reptilian like in that they don't have a lot of heavy mass. They seem to, their bodies seem to be relatively thin connecting very closely to the, to the bone structure, the skeleton. So I don't know if they did or not. You know, when an animal dies and its its flesh decomposes, it's very rare that anything is left behind but the 
but the bones. Now, sometimes there's, there's you know, um, a mummified animals, but the problem with that is that they are losing, as they're going through the mummification process, they are losing all the moisture in their body and fat would do the same thing and basically would slowly disappear. It's like looking at an Egyptian mummy. That's certainly not the way those people look when they were alive. You know, they had mass and they had, but all that um, desiccates, it all shrivels up and and dries up and goes away. So uh, did they have fat? I don't know. It would certainly be useful if you lived in the, uh, if you lived in, in, the uh, cold environments, that would certainly be a place that your body would want to have fat. So again, you left me with a question I don't have the answer to, but it's certainly something I find very interesting. All right, you guys, that will wrap up this special edition podcast. I'll do these periodically when I see that I'm getting a lot of backlog of questions through the Ask Dinosaur George page or people that have called in and through Skype and left a message. Uh, Remember, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. When you go to my podcast page, which is dinosaurgeorgepodcast.com, there are links to all of those that will allow you to do that. While you're visiting my site, I would appreciate it if you go to my catalog and if you see something that you like, please, um, you know, please consider uh, uh, using us as a resource for them. Uh, Check out my website, dinosaurgeorge.com. And for all of you, I appreciate your courtesy and your respect and all that I ask in return for answering these questions is that you show that same respect and courtesy to all of the people who have that same love of paleontology you do. So when you go and you post a comment, uh, please be respectful of other people's, even if you disagree with them. Until next time, keep digging for clues about our prehistoric past. Thank you for listening to The Dinosaur George Show. Please follow us on our social media links and join our mailing list. If you're interested in having Dinosaur George speak at your event, please visit our website at dinosaurgeorge.com. 